Good morning, everybody. My name is Tedza Baloi. I'm the communications officer at Safost. I would like to welcome you all to today's webinar. I'm just going to give you a few house rules. Please note that all opinions and statements are those of the individual making the presentation and not necessarily the opinion or view of Safost. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Safost website within seven days for you to see. For best viewing of the presentation material, please click on the maximize in the upper right corner of the slideshow, then restore to return to the normal view. Please turn off other applications that require internet connection to avoid slow transmission and blurry vision. Audio is transmitted over the computer, and so please have your speakers or headphones on and the volume turned up so that you can be able to hear. Unfortunately, we do not have a tele telephone connection. Questions should be submitted to the presenter during the presentation using the question section at the right side of the screen. Click on the drop down arrow, type your question, and then submit. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Please note that when you type your questions, refrain from using acronyms to allow the moderator to easily read your questions out. With that being said, I would like to thank you and over to Rosie to introduce the first speaker. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are here today to uh, share a lot of uh, expert knowledge from two speakers. Plant-based foods are probably the most talked about trend of 2020 and are likely to become even more popular in the future. Our first speaker is Lisa Ronquist Ross. Lisa is a passionate food scientist with extensive local and global experience working in a variety of multinationals from Unilever, Pioneer Foods, Mars and Woolworths and across the FMCG environment. She has a particular interest in ensuring the application of science and technology is meaningful for both people and planet. Lisa has recently returned from Europe after working for Mars and is currently the R&D executive for Mon Flavors, Sub-Saharan Africa. Lisa is currently completing her R&D PhD studies through the University of Stellenbosch Food Science Facility, exploring the impact of major shifts in food consumption patterns since 1994 on the South African food and beverage industry. She is extensively involved with SAFOS and is currently the chair of the Cape Branch Committee. Her topic is the plant-based movement, opportunities and challenges for South Africa. Lisa, welcome and over to you. Super, thank you, Rosie. Um, I, um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here with everyone today to talk about a, a really fascinating um, shift in food consumption. Um, uh, as a food scientist for the last two decades, this really has been one of the most profound shifts um, that I've been part of. Um, and it's great to be able to share some insights um, and learnings from our uh, research into this area and also to share the floor with Marissa, obviously from Woolworths. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about who is mine, um, this protein transition context, what does it mean, what's driving it, understanding the consumers that are driving it, looking at this meat alternative market from a global perspective as well as local, um, and then just looking at some technical aspects of plant-based meat. So who are we? Mann is a uh, family-owned uh, flavor house, a flavor and fragrance company, fifth generation owned, um, and has deep history in technology and naturals extraction. Um, and with, with being family-owned, has, has a long-term view on the future. Mine operates in uh, 38 countries. Um, it's about a $1.5 billion company um, and invests heavily back into R&D. You can see they're just over 8%. So what is this, this protein transition all about? Um, there are some serious drivers here um, that are causing this, this, this protein transition from animal to plant-based protein. We understand it from a health and wellness perspective. Plant-based diets are, are um, certainly um, uh, lots of evidence to show that they are better for you in terms of reduction in heart disease, um, diabetes, etc. From an environmental sustainability point of view, we know that growing plant-based instead of um, 
using animals to convert these proteins is, is better for the environment from a greenhouse gas um, a land usage as well as water. And then from an affordable nutrition perspective, with populations growing, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, we have to find a way to feed um, the, the population as it continues to grow. Um, and how do we do this in just the, the planet that we have? So there's some new words that we are all learning and, and using, uh, the words plant-based, flexitarian, um, consumers that are actively uh, eating less animal protein, um, this protein transition, vegetarian, vegan, we're all familiar with those terms, but then this, these dairy alternatives, meat alternatives, uh, meat replaces, um, even the terms hybrids, hybrids being blended products, products that use both plant and animal-based uh, proteins in them. So what does the, the context look like and where, where might we go in the future? So if we look at meat alternatives today, they form about 1% of the total meat market. In 2030, they're expected to be up to 10%. And by 2040, they're expected to be up to 25% of, uh, of the meat market. What's fascinating to see there is there's a gray bar there that is also talking about um, alternative meat beyond just plant-based. So cellular, uh, cellular meat, 3D printed meat, there's a whole space there for uh, a diversification of, of how we are going to be um, diversifying out of only meat, meat um, and animal protein. How did COVID impact this shift? Um, certainly it had a, it had a dramatic impact, um, obviously with, uh, in abattoirs and in big meat processes, it's difficult to, to socially distance, it's in a cold environment. And there was a, a, a number of infections and outbreaks that caused closure to meat processes, especially in the US. And um, this caused a, a, a supply sh shortage of meat, meat prices to go up and actually allowed consumers to try um, a plant-based uh, meat analogs or meat alternatives and actually decided that they quite liked it. So it's actually even accelerated this shift into plant-based proteins. So let's, let's turn to this consumer and understanding them a bit better. Uh, Mine has done a number of consumer research surveys. Um, in 2018, they did it in France, UK, Germany, and Spain. And we actually also took a look at the South African consumer in 2019 um, through an online survey, um, over 500 consumers. And um, we specifically looked at LSM 8 to 10, understanding their usage and attitudes um, and their expectations around meat uh, and meat alternatives. So in comparison, you can see here, um, you know, we really are still a very much a meat eating nation. 99% uh, of these consumers identified, uh, recognized they were meat consumers. 1% uh, vegetarian, and we didn't even clock um, a percentage in terms of vegan. Oh, the slide isn't showing. Oh, there we go. Um, so when we look at this, this uh, question was around, um, you know, how often do you eat uh, meat in your lunch and dinner? Um, 60% um, of South Africans eat uh, meat for at least half of their meals. Interesting to see there down at the bottom, uh, these are considered flexitarian consumers, consumers that eat meat less than three times a week. We're about 18% of consumers that um, identify as flexitarian, um, whereas Germany is up to about 32%. And um, Mana conducted those, that, that survey in those countries a few years before, and there's definitely been a shift. So we'll also continue to monitor where this happens from a South African perspective. What are the drivers? Um, very clearly, the drivers of, of eating plant-based um, uh, meats or, pro or proteins is that they are healthy. They bring variety and diversification to meals. Um, and those were the, the key drivers. We also asked consumers, what was their intended uh, consumption of meat in the next five years? 55% um, said they'll eat as much as they do now, 17% said they'll eat more, and 28% said they will, will eat less. When we asked them about plant-based, they actually said 45% said they'd eat uh, the same amount, but 51% said they intended to eat more in the next five years. And this was even higher for the age groups of 18 to 34 um, at 61%. So we asked consumers that hadn't tried any of these types of products, uh, what were the main barriers? And you can see here, taste is a clear, a clear barrier. The products might not be tasty, they don't look appealing, and they're too expensive. 
When you look at prices, um, in this, this is a data for Western, Western Europe, um, you can see actually absolutely they are expensive. Um, with Portugal, they're, they're up to 53% more expensive than, than meat. We took the same data for South Africa. Um, we, this, this says only 5%, but I, I believe the data is, slight, is, is skewed because soya mints is seen as a, a meat substitute and obviously has a lower cost and therefore shifts the numbers. But we know that it's at least um, meat alternatives are at least one and a half, two times and up more expensive than meat. We did a, um, you know, we can, we can look at the, the high LSM um, in terms of their attitudes towards this, but we also did um, um, an ethnographic research. So going in and spending time with consumers in their homes, shopping with them, cooking with them. We did some research in the low income consumer group and what were their attitudes around meat and meat alternatives. And here really um, price and uh, you know, affordability of food is a key driver of choice. And actually what fills my stomach is, is basically the, the, the need here. Um, when we explored um, uh, things like soy mints, it just it really didn't speak to, to these consumers as much as meat did. When they talk about meat, they light up. Um, meat for, for them is, is it's, 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 it's from a heritage and cultural perspective, it's absolutely number one. They talk about this vava voom of meat. It's in the taste, it's in the aroma, it's in the texture, it's, it's how, they, how it makes them feel after eating it. Really is very desirable, but obviously um, very unaffordable. So we felt that there were a number of opportunity spaces here. Um, we, we learned um, that, that packet soup or what consumers uh, call gravy is actually the meat substitute. So those packet soups that bring beefiness and oxtail flavor, they're able to make vegetables taste like meat. They really are the, the true meat, meat alternative. Reinventing soya. Soya is historically associated with feeding schemes. There's real work to be done in terms of taste and texture and aroma, and actually how to use soya. So consumers were confused about how to cook it, um, actually what it was. Some consumers thought it was dried meat. So a lot of work and a lot of opportunity um, in soya. And then shelf stable and, and products that cook quickly. Um, we observed a number of homes where uh, fridges are basically used as cupboards. Um, they cannot afford electricity. So having products that are shelf stable or quick cooking are a clear um, opportunity. So let's look more broadly at the meat alternative market. Um, there is a fascinating slide that shows um, this is a list of the top uh, food and agricultural startups in 2019. Um, and actually, if, if you remember, Beyond Meat um, also had its IPO in 2019 for $9 billion. And this must have caused a huge interest in investors because these top 20 um, food and agricultural startups, four out of five, um, were actually looking at alternative meat or dairy. So plant-based, micro-based, um, cultivated, cell-based um, products were, um, is, and, and continues to be a huge opportunity for investors. If we look here, um, this is the meat industry and how they're responding. These are some of the top um, meat companies around the world. And you can see here that they have either investments or partnerships in plant-based meat and cellular meat or plant ingredients. So looking a bit back into vertical integration on how they're going to be able to access these, these plant-based proteins, as well as 3D meat. These are really people are, are aware that this is part of the future and they need to either be partnering or investing to incorporate it into their, their businesses. We've seen this uh, in South Africa as well. So Live Kindly, um, originally actually a media company that is, uh, is focused on plant-based um, uh, living. And uh, they are now moving into uh, investing into They've invested into Puris, uh, an ingredient company in plant-based um, proteins. They've invested in our very own Fry's Family Foods, so um, everybody knows Fry's, um, and they've bought them, as well as Like Meat in Germany. And investors into, into this acquisition is um, a PHW, a large poultry company in Germany, as well as our very own RCL Foods, uh, recognizing that plant-based is part of our future. So how do companies um, and brands take a look at this? So how do they diversify into plant-based if they're historically a meat brand? You can see here that um, Herta, for example, is a, is a meat brand. They've actually just gone with a vegetable range. Uh, Rugenwalder is saying they keep their brand but, but call out a, a sub-range of veggie or vegetable, you know, uh, plant-based products. 
all people create new brands. So Tyson's Food, the big US uh, meat company, has raised and rooted. Kellogg's has their incognito, um, and Nestle with their Garden Gourmet, creating a new brand. These are some of the examples. I think we're all very familiar with Beyond Burger, Impossible Burger, the Nightlife Burger. Um, burgers definitely were the first way that um, plant-based was able to come in and deliver a fairly um, equivalent taste in, in, um, in terms of their lead counterpart. Yes, the more um, the US and, and Germany, UK, lots of products in this burger space. These are these hybrids that I spoke about them earlier. We look at, um, you know, kind of on the on the one side, completely plant-based, so really using vegetables um, to, to, to create a burger versus 100% animal protein. There's now this blended um, way of bringing in both the plant-based and the, 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 the real meat um, uh, component. Um, these are up to 20 to 42% of, of these products can be um, plant-based. Um, obviously, we, we have different, we've been using soya in, in meat products for years to be able to extend it, and it's from a cost perspective and not necessarily as a, as a health um, focus. So if we look at the South African market, this is Euromonitor data, um, meat substitutes, so meat alternatives, constitute about 5% of this processed meat and seafood category. Um, and expected to grow um, ahead of processed meat. It's really made up of Unilever's uh, soy mints, so 73% is, is really uh, made of soy mints. But you can see here there's more and more up and coming players that are um, uh, innovating and bringing new products to this market. We're actually seeing that we were in the top 10 um, for plant based, uh, as, as, in, as innovators as a country for plant based markets. Uh, the top 10 in, in 2017 and 2018. And there's just been a steady increase of um, activity in the space. Um, this is innovation uh, product, new, new product, number of new product launches over the last 20 years, a huge increase in 2019, and driven by uh, Woolworths, Fry's Foods, the Linda McCartney brand, uh, Marlow Foods, which is corn, the microprotein product, and, and Unilever. In fact, we're about, uh, in the last two years, there's been about two new products a month launching into this space. In terms of the types of products that are being launched, so historically it used to be very much shelf stable and frozen. We're starting to see in the last three years a lot more coming into the chilled um, environment. These are some of the new products that we've seen on the market. Um, we've got Woolies' products there, Fry's, McCain's, um, Goodness, uh, it's, it's a fine Schmecker product. Um, and spas, uh, 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 um, vegetarian uh, style chicken. So some of the technical aspects and, and, and challenges for plant-based. Um, the, the, the whole uh, functionality of plant-based proteins is to create and mimic the texture of meat. So the top um, plant-based proteins is soya, uh, really does rule the roost, and then wheat, and up and coming is pea protein in terms of um, what dominates. This slide talks to, to really um, the emerging protein sources that we see. So soya has, has really been in the market for the longest time. It's been the most uh, researched and most utilized. Um, it's a very close uh, PD-CAS level um, to that of meat, highly available. Um, there are consumer concerns around GM uh, um, and the fact that it's an, an allergen. Um, we've got wheat uh, also being around a long time, very available. Um, and less, less um, uh, of an um, um, amino acid profile similar to meat, so 0.4 there. From a fungi perspective, this is really not necessarily available as an ingredient. It's mainly driven by corn, um, the microprotein product. Um, then we've got pea coming through, uh, becoming much more available as well. Uh, just, just has strong um, off notes that need to be masked. Then we've got insects. Um, I think we all, I'm not sure if everybody's aware of, Great research done by Leah Besser from the University of Stellenbosch. Um, the, the real challenge here with insects is obviously overcoming consumers, um, the, 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 the gross factor really of insects. And she um, did some great work last year with the, the insect experience, a, a pop-up restaurant in Cape Town, trying to understand how to present products to consumers to try to overcome that, uh, that, that fear factor. And then we've got cultured meat, um, obviously, uh, 
I'm no expert on this. It's, it's, um, it's, there's a lot of invest, investment and research happening in this space and certainly will be part of our future. Um, lots more work in the pulses space um, and um, emerging proteins like cowpea, chickpeas, uh, lupin, um, as well as LD actually uh, obviously requiring less land and, and, um, and very high in protein. So how do we process these plant-based proteins to be able to, to create this, this texture of meat? Um, historic, the historical way to do it is through extrusion um, and creating TVP, textured vegetable protein. This is where you introduce ingredients into an extruder. It gets forced through a, um, a heated barrel by rotating twin screws um, and you cause uh, thermomechanical cooking in the barrel that uh, denatures the proteins and gelatinizes the starches. And then on exiting, you get slight expansion um, and then you're able to dry and use this, these, these um, textured vegetable, vegetable proteins. What's happening now is that there's been some advances in, in extrusion um, with high moisture extrusion. So you're able to really um, much better mimic the, the texture of meat. So it follows a similar process. You, um, the ingredients go in through the extruder, they get thermomechanically cooked, but while that mass is still molten, it exits the dye into a long cooling dye. Um, and the cooling allows this, this molten mass to actually start to move into a sort of a laminar flow and texturize differently. Um, and when it exits, it's got a very high moisture content, around 60 to 70%, but those fibers really do look like, um, like meat. So um, these products will need to be either chilled or frozen or actually processed further, but um, a really great uh, new, new technology in this, in this area. So consumers' expectations are high in terms of what um, uh, meat alternatives need to look like, expected to have the same nutritional benefits, the same protein content, and it needs to have the same taste and texture as meat. And this all becomes um, our challenge. Um, so to mimic meat, these are really the, 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 the challenges taste from a taste and flavor perspective. Plant proteins have got off notes that need to be masked. We need to understand interactions that happen between the matrix and, um, and, and flavors. Um, how do you achieve this, this stable taste in the end product? What should it smell like when you cook and eat? How do you achieve that? Um, that whole shift you know, from a raw product to a cooked product, there's complex reactions that happen um, for meat and how do you actually mimic and achieve that? Um, what flavor do you actually want um, to have in the end product? And that's where working with flavor houses is obviously uh, beneficial. From a texture and appearance perspective, how do you mask some of these off, off colors that you can get? Does this product really need to change color from the raw to cooked state? Or do you actually provide a cooked product that is chilled? So many um, dynamics there. Does it need to bleed? Um, the moisture release, how do you get that sizzle when you, when you fry this, this, this uh, plant-based product? Um, and how do you achieve a succulence and juiciness when you actually eat it? Um, obviously, meat is not heterogeneous, and you need to try and achieve that through, through textures. From a nutrition point of view, plant-based proteins have anti-nutritional factors that need to be deactivated. They often um, also not always complete proteins. Um, they need, we need to understand the amino acid profiles and digestibility and perhaps need to be blending and mixing different pulses or cereals to be able to achieve that. Um, and then does one add vitamins and minerals? There are a lot of products that have uh, iron and B12 added to them. And then a big focus, especially in developed uh, countries, is, is this whole um, clean label and over-processing. So obviously, a very simple ingredient list on beef is beef. And, and obviously these meat alternatives have very long ingredients lists as you need to add additives and uh, colorants and texturizers to be able to achieve this similar um, uh, uh, meat like texture and taste. And then there's all the dynamics around um, organic um, ethical considerations and, and local features that might be required. So plant-based proteins go through quite a process until they end up um, from the farm to fork. Um, we obviously harvest them. They um, then go through some sort of milling process, which is a physical process that's um, going to be happening to them. We then concentrate or isolate them further where they're undergoing more physical and chemical processes that start to break up these macromolecules. We then will then uh, texturize them through processes like extrusion where they go through further chemical and physical changes. 
um, and then we bring them back together with a whole lot of other ingredients that we cook or heat and, and undergo further changes. And all of these um, impact ultimately the, the end product. So I'll talk a bit more about flavor challenges really. So as we spoke about, uh, you know, obviously they under, um, as you add flavor into these, into these food matrices, um, they, are, they are going to be different interactions between the, the, the proteins, the fats, the, the carbohydrates in that food matrix. And these can either be intensify the flavor that you've added or, um, or actually modify completely the, the aromatic compounds that you've added. And these can obviously have this, be undesirable or desirable in the in product and it's important to understand that. And then the whole part around off notes and how we actually mask those so we get that um, a cleaner taste. So this, this just talks around these interactions in the food matrix as well when we add um, flavors to products. And sometimes these are reversible and irreversible. Sometimes they're beneficial and sometimes they're not. And we need to understand this to be able to give a product, to develop a product that is able to actually perform and release flavors at the right time. At MIND, we've, we've also developed a toolkit to be able to describe off notes. It's really important for us to understand what these off notes are so we're able to um, know how to mask them. So we've got a, a, a descriptor wheel that's able to describe what these off notes are and we can then provide uh, the right solutions. So whether it's rubbery or beamy um, or rancid, we're able to understand that and then mask it effectively. So to give an example here, we've, uh, if we had to create a pea-based uh, burger, we get off, off notes like beaniness, hay or roasted. We then need to understand what the food matrix is, um, what the moisture content, fat and protein content is and whether it needs to that it goes through a heat treatment. And then we're able to look at our database of masking tools to understand what is the most relevant and um, uh, beneficial uh, technology to use. And then we can validate this through sensory, where we can do a QDA or a quantitative descriptive um, analysis to see that in fact, these off notes are actually suppressed um, through this um, masking technology. So in summary, um, um, at MIND, we have a look at uh, this whole protein transition program from understanding consumers, where they're at, what are their expectations, um, understanding the, the, the plant protein market, and then understanding what, what these ingredients um, do in terms of flavor perception, how do they react in the food matrix, how do we um, understand what off notes are happening and how do we mask them effectively, and then understanding in, in final um, matrix, how do we deliver the, the right flavor profiles. Um, at, at the optimal time. But this can't be done alone. Um, and I think we can, can completely recognize that this, is, this, this plant-based train is happening and to be, be able to create better products um, for consumers um, at, that are more affordable, that taste great, we need to collaborate. Um, this is a consortium of companies um, that are organized through Bridge to Food really look across um, this plant-based spectrum. So we've got food manufacturers, ingredient companies, the process technology companies, and research institutes and universities that work on non-competitive um, uh, ideas and strategies uh, to create better plant-based products. It looks at product quality, product conformity, um, valorization of the whole pulse. How do we make sure we don't, are we not wasteful when we do this? The life cycle analysis of, of these products um, and looking across the value chain to be able to, to create uh, better products that actually do have the right impact on, on health and on the planet. So thank you. Lisa, that was a really fascinating presentation. Um, are there any questions that are coming through from our, from, from our listeners? Maybe perhaps I can kick off with one. You, I think it was fascinating that you say that new technology is resulting in products that are more closely replicating the texture of meat. But you began your presentation by saying that taste is king. Are you finding that any uh, protein sources are proving particularly successful um, or easy to, to flavor? Um. I think they all have their challenge, Rosie, and, and that's um, and that's where where really that, that's that's really where the flavor houses come in. Um, 
I think we get different different off notes with with different proteins. So soy has this beaniness, um, a pea protein has a has bitterness and this, and astringency. So they all have cowpea as well has has lots of bitter notes. So there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, you know, microproteins are often quite sour. So actually, there there is um, there's there's work to be done in all those spaces. I I, I did research um, that in yeast proteins are starting to also be investigated further. So so spent uh, brewers yeast are starting to to be investigated in terms of can they be functionalized? And they also obviously lend themselves much more to that umami savory notes. So potentially that's that's an area which uh, could could have potential in the future. Great. Now we have a question. How do you how do you reconcile? Hold on a minute. It's just moved. <laughs> okay. Let's start with this one. With partnerships between meat companies and plant based brands, are the products still produced in a different production area than the meat? Are are vegan consumers not opposed to being it being produced in the same production area? Yeah, so that's a, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, I, when I when I speak to to companies in in Europe, um, they sort of started out produce meat companies that that started to because you you need the same assets as as meat companies to be able to create these products. They started out sort of at the at the beginning of the week with a proper clean down, and they run their their vegetarian or, or vegan products then, and then would shift over to meat. Um, but as it's grown, they've actually been able to build standalone factories. So um, I think that you know in South Africa, you know that's that's going to be a journey for us um, and how we figure that out. Um, I know there's lots of DNA testing that 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 is happening um, by consumer lobby groups or, or watchdogs to make sure that um, that you know if if products that are claiming to be vegans definitely are vegan. So I think it's up to manufacturers to be responsible and and to make sure that there is no cross contamination. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, I can't really speak for for what vegans would 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 think of that, but I, I think it's there's a there's a whole dynamic here around being able to actually have sufficient volume to set up a, a standalone factory versus actually trying to just establish this market here in South Africa, um, you know, which require the same assets such that meat companies have. Thank you for that answer. Right. How do we reconcile the idea of plant based being more healthy when we're moving towards ultra processed plant protein? And obviously, at the moment, there's a big movement against ultra, ultra processed food. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the big challenge is um, and that's where the focus is in, especially in, in um, I see it in, in, you know, my counterparts in, in Europe, a huge focus on reducing that ingredient list. Um, you know, methyl cellulose is, is uh, I mean, it's wood derived, but that's what um, binds the, these these um, ingredients together when you're making these meat alternatives. There's lots of work to try and understand how to to find alternatives for that that are more natural. Um, I think that's where the focus is now, is to try and simplify these ingredients lists um, and make them more palatable for consumers um, uh, at this stage. Okay, next question. What do you think will be the protein of the future since soya and wheat have allergens and availability in that, what would be available in South Africa? It's, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating question. Um, I, you know, I, I think actually, I, I do think microprotein um, has huge potential. Um, so it's not necessarily, you know, it would be grown in large reactors, but not necessarily, you know, crops that we would grow. Um, but I, yeah, I think that there's a, a, a potential here to diversify, um, um, not only just uh, look at pulses, but um, yeah, I mean, P, P certainly, uh, you know, it's just that P at this stage is, is, is still important. And so there's a cost element to that. Okay, do you think enzymatic hydrolysis can be a key in terms of dealing with off flavors and provide a green solution for these proteins? Uh, I, I I would have to consult uh, some of our, our flavorists. I, I'm sure that there is there's some way to there's definitely some more research that can be done 
to to do to do to do work like that. Um, there's definitely research happening in that space. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's there's more work that can be done uh, for sure. Lisa, can you perhaps uh, answer this one? What are the cost drivers behind the high cost of most of the plant products? The raw materials are generally low cost. Yeah, um, I, the, the struggle is that they're generally imported. So, um, so there's a lot, there's, um, they'll be importing the ingredients. Often these products are imported as well. So um, I was actually on a panel about a week ago on the eFood um, Next platform um, and lots of talk around actually how do we start to build you know, production facilities here? How could we start to look at uh, local sourcing or improved um, um, soya, you know, soya isolates from, from South Africa? Um, you know, there's, there's got to be more work done to, to start to bring this local instead of in, importing. Okay. The, the other the other area there is um, there's a lot of work we can do. Um, so you know while we have these these products that are sitting that are very much to kind of the higher LSMs, there's a lot of work with with soya mints, which is you know obviously very you know is affordable, but it just needs a lot of work in terms of improving the taste, the texture, aroma. So there's this you know there, there's there's definitely an a, an innovation space between the two you know. Um, not only high end and, and low end, but what's in the middle there. Um, we've done great work. You know, the minute you add sources or, or carbohydrates or um, to um, these this, this TVP, you actually can also mask and bring um, great tasting products. So I think there's a lot more work um, between the two, you know, very niche and, 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 and very mainstream uh, soy and mints. There's, there's a lot more opportunity there. I think you've just answered a couple of other questions where people are saying, what are the downsides against soya? Any other comments on that? Uh, you know, I think I think soya did get a, a quite a bad rap over the years. And I think the fact that it's an allergen is a struggle, but it really is the one that's been most researched. Um, it's very versatile. It's got a very close um, PDCAS level to, to meet. Um, you know, it's it's widely available, so there's a there's a lot of benefits for it, um, and you know, and I think I think I think it needs some reframing and and reinvention um, to in order to to, um, to to see it differently. You know, I think it's we often talk about it. You know, it's in in, in developed countries, soy is seen as a you know as, as healthier. Um, and then, and here it's it's just been you know it's a feeding scheme product, and it's 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 it, you know it, it just there's a reshifting and, and reinvention that that could happen for soya. And a question from a vegetarian who's saying, why try to imitate meat-like products? Why not offer yeah. different things? So absolutely. So this this these meat alternatives are for, for consumers that are are not vegetarian or vegan. These are these are flexitarian consumers consumers who are try, who actually don't want to necessarily give up meat, but are willing to but recognize that they 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 want to eat less meat. So the expectation is that it should be like meat. Um, I mean, for vegetarians, there's obviously a a plethora of of other ways to eat. Um, um, so this is very much for for consumers who struggle to give up. Their, 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 their want of, of, of meat. Cool. And then we have a question saying masking flavors will really help in masking off notes, but will they ultimately have an impact on the final taste of the product? No. Uh, well, yes. I mean, they, they, they mask it so that that would, um, you know, often they, 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 they've got sweet notes. Um, but then you would obviously use flavors um, to create more of that, that meaty profile that you want to, to achieve. Um, so, I mean, they definitely have an impact on the final profile because they are reducing the, the off notes. Great stuff. Lisa, thank you very much. I think you, we have run through most of the products. Questions, let's have a quick look. Uh, answer that one. Yep, that's it. Thank you so much, Lisa, and we will Pleasure. move on to our second speaker. We 
We are now going to welcome Marissa Munro. She's head of uh, fresh products at Woolworths. She's a passionate foodie who's been with Woolworths for just over 20 years. Her interest in understanding people and their behavior is at the core of her philosophy to fall in love with consumers' problems and to commit herself to finding innovative ways to solve these. She is, as a skilled, as skilled at developing innovating processes through design thinking as she is passionate about developing people. She believes in the value of diversity in optimizing team effectiveness. She has a curious mind who sees learning as a lifelong journey and the world of culinary arts as a never ending textbook. Marissa, welcome. Marissa will be talking on the plant based movement, the movement from a culinary scene and consumer perspective. And the presentation will cover the global context of the plant based movement from a culinary scene as well as from consumer perspectives. Marissa, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Rosie, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I do find it very difficult to keep my hands still when I speak, so I'll be going like this all over, and I think to make it less distracting, I'll be turning off the, the, the video camera. Um, I will be sharing a retailer's perspective on plant-based futures, and from the onset, I do need to make three confessions. Firstly, as the small white W in the black square at the bottom left of the slide indicates, uh, my perspective will be a bit biased. The second confession, the confession, just like the lady on the right holding the cabbage leaf indicates, I'm also biased to the farming community. I come from a farming community and I want to acknowledge the heart and soul that all farmers and farm workers plow into the soil of our country as it feeds this nation and many people across our borders through food exports. I do have a third confession, but I'll get to that one in a second. At this moment, my transitioning isn't happening and I perhaps need a little bit of technical support there. Where is Tete? Rosie? I'm here. Um, yeah, at, the, at this point in time, the slides aren't transitioning and I'm not sure why. I used my mouse, Marissa. That seemed to work better than page down. Okay, so in the technical setup earlier, page down did work, but nothing is working right now. You're frozen. Hmm. Where's our technical support? Let's try again. There you go. There we go. There we go. So let's just um, look at this scene. Um, it's a picture from a quiet street in, in Cape Town and it was taken in the early stages of lockdown. And, and to be honest, it could have been anywhere in any big city um, anywhere on the globe. But even though we all remember these scenes of the quiet streets, the quiet malls, the quiet restaurants, when we were all confined to our own homes, one can almost forget that there really are a lot of people. There are many people and there's one planet. Which brings me to my third confession. I am 43 years of age and the reason why that is relevant is because I want you to know that our world population doubled in my lifetime. In 43 years, we grew from 3.8 billion to 7.7 .7 billion, and we are heading for 9 billion by 2050. 
I have 30 odd minutes to provide a brief overview on a retailer's perspective on plant-based. And in this 30 minutes, the world population will grow by an additional 5,000 people. The big question about 2050 is, can we feed the world in a way that does not harm the earth as much as it does at the moment? And why this matters? The access to food by local and international law is a basic human right. So for all of us involved in the food systems, the choices that we make to ensure the short and the longer term security of this food system ultimately determines the access to food, which is a human right. So we will have to acknowledge the very important role that food and nutrition plays in the maintenance of good health. So, like this quote says by Robin O'Brien, we pay the doctor to make us better when we should really be paying the farmer to keep us healthy. The global health crisis, the global health crisis and now COVID-19 are forcing change at a, an extraordinary rate. It is having a huge immediate impact on the food and drinks industry, which has found itself in such uncharted territory. Even though the pandemic has been devastating to many businesses, there should also be a glimmer of optimism. This is a unique period that can bring game-changing innovation and long-term positive change. The whole world has suffered a severe shock through the pandemic, showing just how fragile food systems and systems in general are. The infrastructure of the system is becoming more and more top of mind. Stanford University have stated that the climate change contributed to the risk of the pandemic and though already a global emergency, we start to understand what ripple effect the pandemic will have. So extreme weather patterns continue to emerge, droughts, fires, hurricanes and floods. And then talking about waste, our future depends on reusing what we have in a sustainable way. Fortunately, one resource that is unlimited is innovation. And many companies are developing ingenious ways to reduce, reuse, and recycle. Waste was once considered, um, waste has now become a resource. In the circular economy, uh, the resources are therefore kept um, in use for as long as possible, with a maximum value extracted by recovering and regenerating material and resources at the end of their service life. The focus is therefore on the use of renewable energy, the removal of toxic chemicals that cannot be reused, and the reuse of water uh, of waste to improve material product system and business model designs. Waste created an uh, is created as a result of excessive consumerism, and then a voice of predominantly the younger people of today who is saying that enough is enough. In 2016 already we noticed a massive dial up on the global stage, especially as the link was made by mass media between meat production, greenhouse gas and the environment, with consumers facing a relentless bombarding of information and, and to be fair, very often misinformation relating to meat production. Unfortunately, with beef in particular, finding itself in the bullseye of the target. And at the time, National Geographic published an article stating that 15,000 litres of fresh water goes into the producing of only one kilogram of beef. At the same time, the World Health Organization stated that processed meat causes cancer. Campaigners and activist groups responded with promoting first a meat-free day, then a meat-free Monday, and now it's meat-free months. This year, vegan January. In the UK alone, hundreds of new plant-based products and menu items were launched, including the first vegan new area offerings from the fast food giants like KFC, McDonald's, and Burger King. At Willis, we also look at influencers leading the charge, seeing a shift in the clean meat movement that's really starting to gain momentum. We also see, um, we also see a rise of the likes of vegetable butchers. Um, Rene Redzepi, a famous Danish chef from Noma in Copenhagen, I think uh, two, two or three star Michelin restaurant, but, um, but really bringing um, vegetable as a, as a raw material to celebrate to the, to the forefront. So the question then is, if meat is no longer center stage on the plate, then what is? And we find plants are increasingly becoming the hero on the plate. 
but in ways that are bold and brave and non-apologetic. Like fashion, look at the catwalks as an indication of what will shape the future of apparel and fashion. Likewise, as foodies, we look to the chefs and the restaurant scene. As the majority of markets across the world is trending towards plant-based eating, all sources indicate that this global shift is yet to stay. It's therefore called the biggest global culinary, culinary mega trend. Reference from the Plant Forward Culinary Summit of the Culinary Institute of America last year. So with that, the quest for exciting and new solutions. So often the vegan or vegetarian lifestyle got typecasted as one of deprivation, where the emphasis is on what is removed and what is stripped out of, of, of the food or the diet at large, rather than focusing on what it is or even potentially what it can be. And sadly, for too long, plant-based was relegated to the bottom of the flavor league. Now, culinary, culinary innovation paved the way for massive flavor explosion as chefs are using techniques like sous vide, fermentation, pickling, grilling, and charring. Globally, chefs have adapted their menus to have a wider plant-based offering and is now getting recognized for their work. Chefs to watch are Dan Barber, Thomas Keller, Amanda Cohen, Yotam Ottolenghi, and locally Kayla and Osborne from the Chef's Table. Plant-based lifestyles are driven by influencers on social media, many of whom have had great success launching their own product ranges or endorsing plant-based brands. And an obvious one to call out is Delicious Liella, with 1.9 million followers and a growing product range. There is also an increase of whole families adopting a plant-based lifestyle, which creates a need for inspiring solutions for families. And a really important notion for us to tap into is accessibility and the ease of ad adoption. It's about ma making access to plant-based meals, products, less intimidating, make it easy to use, make it affordable and make it delicious. Let's talk about ingredients. Um, seaweed, one of the fastest growing items on restaurant menus. Seaweed contains vitamins B, B12, which is law, uh, rarely found in, plant, uh, in most plants. Also rich in iron, potassium, magnesium, zinc, manganese, and overall consists of 13 vitamins, 20 amino acids, and 60 trace mineral elements. It has the highest source of plant protein and zero calories. It's a fantastic source of umami, and the magic of dashi. Locally, Wolfgat has been recognized across the world using many varieties of seaweed forage from the west coast of South Africa. Jackfruit, used as a vegan protein for its meat-like quality when cooked. It's versatile and, and its meat-like texture is ideal for barbecue or pooled meat style recipes. Jackfruit trees are built for climate change as they re are resistant to higher temperatures and drought. It's packed with vitamin C, potassium, and fiber, as well as plenty of essential vitamins and uh, minerals. Dishoom, as a restaurant, is famed for utilizing jackfruit in some of their curries. The honey nut squash, made famous by Chef Dan Barber from the Blue Hill Farm. Honey nut squash is a winter squash cultivar bred from butternut and buttercup squash. It has a similar shape and flavor to butternut squash, but averages about half of the size and is significantly sweeter. It has a dark tan to orange skin and, um, and a fleshy pulp. It's very easy to use with and cook with. An obvious one is mushroom. Mushrooms have become more popular since the increase of the vegan vegetarian movement. It, it is a popular way to reduce or el eliminate meat in a dish. Mushrooms are a healthy addition to any diet. In general, mushrooms are low in calories, fat-free, and provide protein and fiber. They're also an excellent source of B vitamins and selenium, an antioxidant essential in keeping your immune system strong and healthy. In general, we really have seen such fantastic innovative uses of grains, pulse, pulses, weeds, new varietals, and amazing innovation. Global food services markets also shifted as illustrated with veggie prep, pioneering in plant-based in the fast food scene. 
and really proving to be hugely successful. Plant based is also showing up on menus of KFC, McDonald's, and Burger King. And of course, everybody would be familiar with the likes of the Impossible Burger and, and the Beyond Meat Burger. Our friends in the UK, MNS, have successfully launched their plant kitchen, offering a, a range of over 50 items across good to go categories and ready meals. And these are all 100% plant based. I think it is fair to say that Woolies has therefore been very, very well positioned to respond to this uh, plant-based lifestyle. Building on um, what we stand for in terms of our good business journey, responsible farming, fishing, responsible sourcing. And so we were well positioned to respond um, roughly two years ago when we did a massive dial up. As you can imagine, I'm more of a consumer science, scientist than a food scientist. So the uh, next part of the presentation is really going to deep dive into how we understand our customers. Um, I, I, I heard Rosie saying in the introduction that we talk about falling in love with our customers' problems. And it's really something that we challenge our teams to do. And why we say falling in love is because if you fall in love with a problem, you really invest your heart and soul to solve it. It's very often very difficult to get feedback from our customers and our consumers. They set very high demands and it's, and it's really challenging to always meet them. Um, hence, a, a lot of our new product development is based on the back of deep insights into our customers. Of course, customer data is important, but what we are particularly interested in is understanding their mindset and understanding what drives their behavior. So one of the first insights when we started to understand our plant-based customer is that it is not a homogenous customer. We really have found that our customers are sitting on a spectrum as far as the relationship with protein is concerned. You get your traditional meat eater on the one side of the spectrum and on the complete opposite end, what we would term vegan. But there is a transitional journey too. So next to a traditional meat eater, we also have what we call a conscious uh, meat eater, which would be a consumer that might still consume pro animal based protein, but look to make better choices. And so what's important there is the welfare of the, the animal, that the, that the meat um, or the animal is free from routine antibiotics um, and growth hormones, etc. Then you get a customer that are actively looking to make better meat choices, but at the same time, reduce the amount of animal uh, based protein in their, in their diets and by inference, increase the amount of, of plants that they, that they include in their diet. And then there's the customer who obviously eat no animal-based um, meat, and, that, and that's what we would um, term vegetarian. So it's important for us to understand that we've got different needs to meet with our customers sitting on different places of the spectrum. So when we unpack our customers' desires and expectations, what was very clear is that there's a far more holistic approach to how customers see health. Um, and there's been a shift from very strict dietary approach to health to a far more holistic sense of well-being. Um, I think a question was asked earlier, you know, why would people not just actually celebrate veggies? And, and, and that really the point. I think through our um, offer of delicious, fresh, sustainable farm produce, we're really able to facilitate healthier, better, wholesome, natural choices for our consumers without necessarily always having to add um, and process the, the product too much. But again, depending on our customers' particip participation scale, there are some of those who, who, who tend to want to opt into convenience and, and hence opportunities for us to also develop into that space. So, understanding our consumers, like we said, there's a broader context. We needed to understand the challenges, and but our decisions and how we responded were ultimately rooted in science and good nutritional principles. Um, because in this instance, in particular for plant-based customers, that really is important. 
Um, Cindy, our um, uh, dietitian also cited that South Africans don't um, don't eat enough veggies uh, generally in our diet. We very easily consume enough protein, but vegetables specifically, um, we generally don't don't um, eat enough of. Currently, also dietary patterns are harming both people and planet, and many of you may have seen the Lancet report. So the increased population consumption of fruit and vegetables has been included as a goal in the Department of Health um, draft strategy document. So hence also very much aligned to our own health manifesto of including far more sustainably grown fruit and veg into the diet. And like I said, it's understand, important to understand why. Um, not a single vegetable or fruit can provide everything that you need in the diet, and therefore variety is so, so important in how we approach our diets. Our health manifesto, um, like I said, it is about promoting a diet that is um, encouraging consumers to eat a colourful variety of sustainably uh, farmed fruit and vegetables. Um, I think if you've ever piled 400 grams um, or more of veggies on your plate, it's quite a daunting task to, to eat through all of that. And so it, it requires an element of being deliberate around how one portions that through, through the day as well. To celebrate wholesome, fresh and raw food, the best of fresh and raw produce, to elevate sustainable farming and production, to drive this plant forward focus in all of the new product development that we do across foods, and to have more products, including whole grains, legumes, and pulses, rather than necessarily just always defaulting to refined um, starches. And already, um, and already our produce business is the heartland of Woolies. What's quite important is that we always are um, dialing up our communication to communicate our science-based facts. I think what is fair to say is that in this world of super connectivity, consumers are bombarded with so much so much information and it's very difficult for them to, to, to distill what is right from wrong and we've got a role to play as a responsible retailer to lead with science-based facts. There's no life without motion. We're born with a desire to keep moving. To reach higher, feel stronger. To live a better life. Living well started eating well. Okay, so Lisa was actually still with Woolies at the time when we said so. In Against being well positioned in terms of our manifesto, what we stand for, our good business journey, and really sensing that it was about time that we go to market with a compelling, um, a compelling range and the correct choice um, for, for customers who, who choose to to live this li uh, plant based lifestyle. We we needed to respond with speed to market. Um, I think it's fair to say that by and large, the the capabilities and technologies to develop. Um, meat analogues are, are um, not very well established here compared to perhaps the markets like like Europe and America. So for us to um, to uh, achieve the speed to market that we were looking for, there was a big part of our range that initially was imported. Um, and, I, and I think it's fair to say that Woolies um, really believes in supporting local. And so there's a parallel work stream around getting to market with um, with, with regards to accessing products, um, specifically meat analogs through imports, while we develop the local technologies and capabilities and doing the right investments in order to be able to localize. Okay, so I spoke about the participation scale a, a moment ago, <clears throat> and and what this is really is for us to say our customers, depending on the need states, participate with food um, in different ways. Sometimes you may have um, time. In fact, these days, in, in in that more people are working from home and less traffic is spent um, time is spent in traffic. You find people tend to gravitate far more to the side of the participation scale that we talk 
about that is scratch cooking. Um, this is really where you cook from absolute raw. You would trim, you would trim yourself, you will peel yourself, you'll chop and dice. Um, and then there's a spectrum right through to the other end of, of absolute uber convenience. So when we approach product development, we tend to look at what solutions we offer our customer across the participation scale. So depending on whether they opt for the convenience spectrum or whether they choose to, to, to cook completely from scratch or whether they actually want to just be able to add a few components together, we've got the solutions for them. The plant-based lifestyle transcends in our customers' need states beyond just food. Um, the obvious one is, you know, in categories like your, your, dairy, your dairy, free, meat analogs, etc., etc., healthy snacking, but also into, um, into a, sentiment and a, a sentiment and a mindset that believes in, you know, um, doing good through your, through your, um, your choices of, of cleaning materials and personal care, and, and hence also the recent relaunch of our earth-friendly ranges and our um, personal care offer. So as we are currently finding ourselves, um, I was actually surprised, to be honest, when Lisa told us the other day that we were the number one innovator and it didn't seem like anybody else in the organization know this. We kind of tend to just get on with business and, um, uh, you know, sort of like stop and learn and redefine and continuously try to, to, to learn and improve. Um, but I think it's fair to say that um, that through a relatively compelling proposition that we've got, um, I think we are able to facilitate an answer to most of our consumers' needs. But um, also honest to say that there's still room for improvement. Um, like I said, there's um, a big piece of work that we're still doing around scoping, understanding where we, where we have got gaps, um, dialing up the nutritional goodness of the product. I think we've been given the feedback that very often our more prepared convenience lines tend to be a little bit too indulgent and not that healthy, i.e., you know, very, a lot of cheese being used, crumbs being used, et cetera, et cetera. So we're continuously distilling that feedback and it informs our NPD plans. Um, it's important to also find the right suppliers to partner with us. Um, as a retailer, it's important for us to build lasting relationships with our suppliers. And very often on the back of that comes huge capex investments in order to be able to drive the innovation that we look for and that our customers, that our customers look to. So we continue to research, we follow trends. When, when possible, we will be traveling again. We play with new ingredients in our culinary um, innovation center. We play around with techniques using the, the, the science of food and the culinary craft and skill. And when it comes together, it really creates fantastic innovation. Um, and this all informs a two to three year forward new product development plan. And then just to conclude, um, we love this quote um, that says, the food we choose make a difference uh, by Dr. Michael Greger. He's an American physician, author, and a professional speaker on public health issues. And therefore, choose well. And we understand the role that we play in enabling our consumers to choose well. Thank you. Marissa, thank you. That was a really interesting presentation and I'm sure we're going to have some questions to throw at you. One quick one from me. Um, Lisa mentioned in her presentation that vegan food was not really featuring in 2019. Are you seeing that that has actually changed in 2020? I, is the appeal of vegan food in South Africa on the up? 100%, 100%. We've had an interesting um, period of trialing and, 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 and I suppose there's a perspective also that it isn't featuring because it's not necessarily coming together in a, to a great extent in our stores with critical mass. So we've been through a period of trialing to understand what is the best home within our stores to create almost a plant base and specifically vegan within it destination so that it's easier for consumers to find and to navigate that. And in the few stores where we've started to bring that solution together and you are able to present 
the total range with a full choice and hence creating that critical mass. We've seen phenomenal growth. So that's really been, um, that, that's really, that it continues to grow week on week on week. Great, that's, I think that's an interesting observation. Um, we've got a question here. Well, it's actually more a comment, but I'm sure we could make it into a question. They say another fascinating presentation, thank you. What about developing indigenous flavorants, for example, wild ginger, pepper bark, and salvia into the culinary industry? Are there not also indigenous foods that could be developed into a niche space? Beans, marula, um, kind of things. What are your feelings on that? No, 100%. Um, we run internal culinary workshops and we have actually recently done one where we specifically forced ourselves to only look at local ingredients. Um, so 100% aligned with that. I, I need to tell you a very quick story. Um, I was on a flight back from the UK end of uh, last year. It was very close to Christmas and um, not back, in fact, out um, uh, to the UK. And I sat next to a professor from the um, University of KZN and I'm actually quite pleased that I can't remember his name now um, because of the conversation that we had. Um, so he took, his, he took his shoes off in the middle of the flight, obviously to get comfortable, um, and he sat right next to me and um, there were lots of holes in his socks. So I made a comment around his socks and I um, said, I hope Father Christmas would get you a new pair of socks, but that just really struck up a conversation between the two of us. And he is actively involved in research around circular economies, and he brought up the topic of the um, the pigeon pea. So I know earlier a question was also asked around, you know, um, soy as a raw material, but with it, the issue of it being an allergen. So pigeon pea, apparently, I'm not that familiar with it, but um, is a relatively high protein um, um, grain or pulse. I'm not sure necessarily what's the technical classification, and it is. It's thriving in the in the in the South African context with our weather patterns. So um, it, I would imagine therefore it's also indigenous. So um, an interesting one also. I'm not sure if any of the, the scientists in this webinar is familiar with pigeon pea, um, and to what extent it's already grown or not in commercial crops. I'm, I'm unsure, but but certainly you know that's a type of innovation that we need to try and research and understand so that it can enable us um, to, to have scale if it is a potentially um, viable raw material in the future. Cool. Uh, what's the percentage growth of plant-based products in the South African market? Um, let me understand the question. Are we talking about the, the, the sales performance growth or are we talking about the extent to which new introductions happen? I think it's um, sales sales that they're looking for. That just how is how much is it growing year on year? The the interest from the consumers. Yeah. So not not. Um, sorry, Rosie, you were, you were saying. I was, I was going to say not necessarily the the um, a number of new launches which there are, which obviously relates to the popularity. The, the total growth of the of the sector I think they're looking at. Yeah, I, 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 it's difficult for me. I can't comment on the growth of the sector, but perhaps in her research, Lisa would be able to um, to, to maybe quickly have a look if she can help us on an answer there. Um, look, I think for 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 us in retail, anything around ten to fifteen percent growth year on year in these days are good growth. In plant based, I'm comfortably talking four or five times that. Of course, you're coming off a, off a, off a smaller base, but the growth is buoyant. And obviously, yeah, so, that's why. Sorry, Lisa. Sorry, just just the Euromonitor data shows that the compound annual growth um, over the last five years has been nearly 10%, with projections um, to be just over 10% in the next five years. That's Euromonitor data. Um, Marissa, you're being asked, is there more innovation on the savoury or sweet side of plant-based products in the near future? And what is the consumer expectation? Mm. Um, to date, it's been certainly slanted to savoury categories. Um, we're in development on, on sweet, for sure. And 
very much as a demand from consumers. Look, I suppose it's difficult sometimes for us to reconcile how does health and sweets sit together, but um, as a retailer, we've always stood for health and indulgence. Um, and so we, we are confident that through the development that we've got in the pipeline, we'd be able to, um, to, to tackle the sweet category, um, but still doing so with product intrinsics that, that make the product um, a better choice, but, but vegan for sure. Cool. And in the post-COVID era, are you seeing a trend for consumer behaviour changing and there's there going to be an even bigger swing towards plant-based products? I think if we look at the, the, the backdrop against which there are so many um, concerns about what we're doing to this planet, as, as per the earlier parts of my, um, my presentation, I would most certainly imagine so. Um, I think people are becoming far more uh, mindful and conscious about the decisions that they make. And there's a, most certainly there's a millennial mindset that drives that. But, um, you know, if, if I just think of, of us with, with families and kids, the, 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 the curriculum is being taught. And so the, young child, the younger generation is often shaping and influencing up their parents and it's just generally driving a, a, a mindfulness around what what impact the choices that we that we make, what impact it has on commun on communities and on our planet. So I would most certainly think so. Um, do plant-based products always have a health connection? Why not indulgence as well? Mm. Um. Generally, it does. Um, like I said earlier, we are starting to develop more into to sweeter and indulgent space as well. Again, it goes to the point of giving our customers choice across the participation scale. <clears throat> Great. Well, it looks as though the questions have dried up. Oh, um, hold on. We, the person who asked about the uh, the performance, they were looking at sales performance. So I think you've answered that question adequately. Great. Well, I would just like to wrap the um, the webinar up by saying thank you both for excellent presentations. I think between you, you have really highlighted the how and why plant based products are becoming so um, popular and important. Um, especially in relationship to the South African consumers, because quite often South Africa kind of is limping along behind the rest of the world, whereas in, to some extent, I think as Lisa showed, we're actually up there with this one. We're, we're really in the same area. Um, and I think you've both given us lots of food for thought. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.